Terrific, thank you. Thank you. Give yourselves all a round of applause for coming out. Hooray you. Hooray you. We have an awesome show for you tonight. If you've never been here, this is the Greater Than Social Club put on by Greater Than Records and Illegal Peets. And uh, some of you've heard of it. So they're in open air. Uh, we have one great band and one great comedian, and I'll host the evening. I'm an okay comedian who will do both. I'm an average comedian. How is everybody? Great? Good? Good? We can start with you, work our way around the room, just find out exactly. It's a small enough room, we can do it. Just use up 13 minutes of time. Perfect. A lot of people I know within my eyesight, that never makes it really awkward. It just seem like I'm in their basement performing. You know, guys don't have to move. They're great. Mike and Malka, everybody. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. Um, <laughs> boy, it's kind of cramped up here. Okay. We'll move this right here. It does feel like a basement, the coolest basement on earth. <laughs> Never touch the band's instruments if you're a comedian, ever. I made that mistake once with a tambourine, and they were angry. It was a fucking tambourine. <laughs> probably the most invincible instrument there is. And they're like, don't touch the instruments. It's like, I, put, I couldn't break it if I wanted to. I, I'd have to like saw it or something. I just wanted to give it one shake. No. So don't, don't do it. Don't do it. I am, um, and there's stuff right here too. Don't touch anything. Okay, I'll just stay on the rug. <laughs> I'll just stay like this. Normally I like to walk around, but instead I'll just have a, a strong pose there. Oh God. I did uh, CrossFit for the first time a week ago. Probably the last time, too, I think. <laughs> you ever done CrossFit? It's all the fun of like a Serbian forced labor camp, <laughs> minus the interesting story of how you got there, is how it feels. Like the whole time I was like, am I in trouble with somebody? Because that's how this feels. It feels like I've, I've done something wrong to someone, and now they're punishing me with this exercise routine. It was a 20 minute workout. I was able to do 18 of those minutes. That feels pretty sad to not be able to exercise for 20 minutes. And to make it even worse, they play like the shittiest, the shittiest techno music I've ever heard in my life while I'm doing it. I'm like, it was already hard enough. And now I, I actually feel like I'm in hell. Like we'd have to run. We were like doing all these like horrible, <laughs> disgusting exercises. And then we'd have to run out of the building all the way across the parking lot where we would do like squats in the middle of the run. Not just a run, which is horrible, but also like this in the middle, like yeah, perfect. It wasn't like a Nazi thing. You'd use both hands. I am holding a microphone. Um, not that that is even a Nazi thing, but some of you may have been worried like, is this a Nazi thing? No, it's not. So I'd run out and it was like sweet relief. Just run out, you just hear like birds. It's like silent. And then I'd be running back in and then that techno, the strains of techno would <laughs> pick up about halfway through the parking lot. It's like, fuck, here we go again into hell. It, would, uh, it was awful. But I always like, whenever I do exercises, I like to look for like applicable skills. And so after doing CrossFit, it's good to know that if I ever needed to throw my three-year-old daughter up into a second floor window, I could do it. I could do it if, if we needed to. If we were like running from wolves and there was like a barn and it just had like a window, I could like lay up, <laughs> whoop, and she's like in and safe. And then I'm eaten by wolves probably, but I'll just like air squat defense myself out of there. <laughs> Gotta look for applicable skills. Like running, that's, you know, I'm always like, good, good to know how to run, getting chased by something, animal, monster, be able to run, stuff like that. I do a lot of yoga applicable skills in yoga, holding in a fart for at least an hour <laughs> is the number one skill. I'm so good at it. I'm so good at it now. It's like I've replaced my intestines with some sort of like ceramic pipe with like a seal. That's how it feels. I'm that good. <laughs> but I have a problem. I have, uh, I bought a yoga mat and I somehow bought the fartiest yoga mat possible, which I didn't know. Like any moisture, if I have like any sweat on my body and then I do anything on the mat, it sounds exactly like a fart. It sounds more like a fart than like a real fart or like a whoopee cushion. It's like it was intended to do that. Like there was like, they make like joke yoga mats at like the fake dog shit factory. And that's what I bought and I just didn't read the label. <laughs> like, cool, like $75 for a farting yoga mat. Yeah, that sounds like a real thing. So that's the yoga mat I have. So every class, I'll be doing something, and I just want to like speak and be like, it, I wasn't a fart guy. It's my mat, guys. When it gets wet, it does this. But I was, uh, I was hanging out with my friend, and uh, he was visiting town, so I took him to 
uh, this restaurant by my house called Lucille's. It's this tasty, like, Louisiana breakfast. And I wasn't planning on doing yoga. I was just planning on eating a giant Louisiana country breakfast. So that's what we did. It's like red beans and rice and sausage and eggs and grits. It was delicious. And then I dropped my friend off and I checked my watch. And I was like, hey, if I hurry, I can still make it to yoga class. I can still do it. Why would that be a bad idea? I just power gorged a giant Louisiana country breakfast. And I'm going to speed across town and then go do yoga. So I did that. And it was the worst fucking idea but I did it. I held in. I didn't, I didn't like fart or anything. I like did my yoga. I was like, God, this hurts so bad. I'm just like turning my guts into like the curliest poodle balloon animal you've ever seen. Like so horrible. But the whole time my mat is making these like farting noises. And the whole time my body is getting rid of that Louisiana country breakfast through its sweat. Just like country sausage gravy sweat. And it's disgusting. And I'm just like, everyone in this class knows who this is. It's the guy making the noises in like the hazy cloud of meat fog over in the corner. It would have been less embarrassing if I'd just gotten up and ran to the front of the class and then like tap danced out like an entire fart routine. I would have felt like I had more dignity than that. Just like, it's me, I'm just disgusting. And it's just a, it's just my slippery mat, guys, because I'm sweating a lot. This is horrible. This is disgusting. Oh my God. There's a woman in my yoga class. I don't know if this is, I feel like what happens in a yoga class should, should just stay in there. Like when you go to like a doctor, there should be some sort of confidentiality because it is inherently embarrassing. But, but there was a woman in one of my recent yoga classes whose name was Stephanity. As in like a merging of Stephanie and Infinity, which is the most amazing name. I don't know if it's real or if it's just her yoga name because some people have special yoga names. You gasp like you know who it is. There can only be one, so you have to know who it is. That's not like top 10 baby names of Narnia 2008. Oh, she lives in Boulder. She lives in Boulder. Yeah, that's probably the same person. That's, pro that's not an excuse. Stephanity in yoga class? Oh, yours lives in Boulder? That's probably a different one. That's probably a different one. She works there? She performs here. Oh, so everybody knows her. Denver's, I guess she would. That's such a unique name. She could be here. She's just sitting in the back, just glaring at me. It would be intimidating. When your name is merged with the infinite, it is intimidating. She performs here like she does burlesque, I guess. Circus performer, even cooler. Well, now I feel like a world-class piece of shit for making fun of a circus performer. Well, she's really good at yoga, too. So she has two things. Two things going on. All right, I'll never mention anything that happened in yoga class again. <laughs> I knew somebody would know who it was. I knew it. Because there can't be more than one. Does she live in Boulder? Let's solve this mystery right now. Yes! Yes, saved there. That's all solved. That's all solved. And this venue's never having me back again. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> what if she did work here? She's just... Uh, just, it was somebody else. It was a different Stephanity I was talking about. <laughs> it was different. Anyway, enough about yoga, y'all. Y'all. I wish a yoga teacher. I did go to a yoga class. I'll just keep talking about it and digging myself a deeper grave. I did have a yoga teacher who used get her done in a non-ironic, joking fashion, which I feel can only happen in Denver. Like, get her done, man. You're teaching yoga. Don't ever combine these two things again. This is horrible. He gets out and gets in his Pego truck with like truck nuts on the back and drives away. <laughs> Throws his yoga mat in like a gun rack that he uses. He uses for both. Both things. <laughs> no, that's a good tag. If I ever do that joke again, I might do that. I might do that. Um, when I'm not making millions of dollars doing comedy, <laughs> I have this freelance writing job where I write blogs for the most boring companies on earth. That's like a real job now. You just write like meaningless blogs that no one will ever read for these companies so they'll stay afloat in the Google search rankings because they have new content coming in. So they're like literally the worst companies you could ever write a blog for. One of them is a horse trailer website, sells horse trailers. Every week I have to come up with a blog idea that <laughs> pertains to fucking horse trailers. Every week. So I set up a Google News alert, you know, like I gotta stay abreast of trends in the horse trailer industry. Unsurprisingly, jack shit happens with horse trailers. 
other than incredibly gruesome fatal accidents involving horse trailers, which is the one thing I can't write about when I'm talking about horse trailers. Just like another spectacular man on equine car crash in Iowa. I can't, I can't talk about that. So I have to come up with other shit like top rest stop restaurants from here to Albuquerque, that kind of shit, just killing my brain. But another one of the businesses is a, uh, a CPR training company. So again, all things CPR. But I read up on the history of CPR so I could write these blogs. And I didn't know this, but CPR is like sort of a relatively new thing. I thought it had been around forever, but it actually came around in like the 50s. Before that, people were just doing it wrong like, <laughs> to different degrees. And it goes back until like the mid 1700s when people really started doing it because people would get drunk and fall into rivers in Europe. Uh, in like Amsterdam, and people were like, hey, that guy was cool, let's try to bring him back. So they were like, so then they started in the mid-1700s, but they had no idea what they were doing. So they would do ridiculous shit, like, like tickle them, and like yell at them, and put like a coin on their head, like the dumbest shit you could do. But the best thing they tried, by far, the best thing they tried, was they would use a bellows, you know, like a, a bellows, to pump tobacco smoke in the dead person's anus. That was a thing that they did. That's a real thing that they did, which is so amazing. First of all, I didn't even know there were fraternities in the mid 1700s. That's like the most frat way you could possibly revive a dead body. Like everyone's standing around in a group, like, what should we do? We tickled them, we yelled at them, and then like a dude in a powdered wig and backwards baseball cap pops up. Like, pump smoke in his ass. They're like, all right, we'll try it. We'll try it. Can you imagine if it worked, though? Like, if that did work, even if it just worked one time on, like, a fluke, you're just, like, dead one minute. Then you wake up, like, what the fuck is going on? You're just, like, so angry when you realize what happened. You'd never be able to share that story with anyone. The most interesting story of your life, the best party story ever, you can't even tell me. <laughs> yeah, I fell in a river and I drowned. And I was legally dead for like 12 minutes. I know. How'd they bring me back? I don't know, I never asked. No, I didn't ask. No, no I don't smoke. Why does everybody keep asking me that? <laughs> Alright, that's gonna do it for me up front. Like I said, I'm gonna host. We got a great show for you tonight. Um, right up front, how about a big round of applause for your wait staff? You are awesome. Make sure to be patient with them as they bring you your drinks. They want you to have your drink as badly, if not more badly, than you want you to have your drink. So be patient with them. Um, and again, I want to thank our sponsors, Illegal Pete's, uh, Greater Than Records, and Open Air. Those are all great sponsors that make this show possible. So we have a great comedian. Um, I know this comedian uh, from, I used to live in Los Angeles, and uh, I befriended this comedian when I lived out there. And he would, <laughs> I don't know if he wants me to tell this awesome story, but he would always walk our dog for us. And uh, my then wife, um, <laughs> like, referred to him as our dog walker more than a comedian, which he has never forgotten to this day. He's never, he's never forgotten that. But he's originally from Canada. Um, he's one of my favorite comics. He came out here to do our show, The Grocks, and, and stuck around to do this. Uh, it's his last show here in town. Please welcome Will Weldon. It was not that she referred to me as a dog walker when I am a comedian. It's that she would refer to me as their dog walker when I was their friend. <laughs> Honestly, there was a party once, and I was there with my then wife, bad trend, and uh, and we're there, and Andrew's ex is like, oh, this is Will and Rebecca. Will walks our dog. I'm like, I also hang out with your husband all of the time. All the time. So much more time is spent with your husband than your dog. I at least walk your husband if... Um, also, what's great about Andrew making fun of someone who works here without knowing it is that also there's a piano backstage and all over the piano are signs that say, no drinks on the piano, no drinks on the piano. The sign on the wall, no drinks on the piano, right in the middle of the piano. The biggest, fullest drink you have ever seen. <laughs> Enormous, and it's clearly his. <laughs> Yeah, he's doing it, guys. I am, uh, I do live in Los Angeles. It's nice to, like, 
get out of LA and come to a city where I look like the proper asshole that I am. Because uh, in LA, everybody is walking around in like little t-shirts and cardigans when it's way too hot to be wearing them. And it's just nice to go somewhere and get off the plane and be like, oh yeah, I am a dickhead. I forgot. I'm a huge dickhead. Why are there no dudes wearing eyeliner walking around? <laughs> Very strange, the lack of eyeliner on men in this city. <laughs> Must be out of town. There must be some sort of hard rock festival somewhere. Uh, I, uh, oh, yeah, here's something else about me. I don't understand why, one of the things I don't understand is that when someone is like really depressed, I don't understand why one way people will try to like convince them not to kill themselves is they'll go, no, no, do not kill yourself. You know why? Because that is the easy way out. Isn't that the appeal of suicide? <laughs> Isn't that like suicide's one good quality and you have led with it in the anti-suicide debate? Like, do you know anyone who is like, if only there was a very complicated solution to all of my problems? <laughs> it's like trying to convince someone to stay on their diet by going, hey, don't eat that. It is delicious. <laughs> yeah, you would just love it, so don't eat it. It's totally scrumptious. Like, we're people. We're human beings. We take the easy way out of every situation there is. The door is the easy way out of a building. No one ever goes, well, I'm going to take the chimney because it builds character. Dude, the easy way out is the greatest slogan of alt, I would buy anything that was advertised as the easy way out. And the commercial would be so easy to write. It would just be like a handsome guy at the beach and he's like walking and he's got like a coat over his shoulder. He just stops, looks right into the camera and he just goes, uh, suicide. It's the easy way out. And then he keeps walking off the edge of a cliff into the ocean filled with rocks. And you're like, that did look easy. Where did they find the actor for the snuff commercial? <laughs> what a weird way to end that joke. Uh, I like a lot of weird references in my sets. So if you like them, that's fine. If you don't, welcome to the club. Uh, I, uh, and Andrew mentioned I'm also uh, Canadian. I live here. Uh, that's fine. I had nothing to do with my being Canadian, actually. I was not like... I think I'll crawl out here, Mom. Um, no, but if I had, I would have been one smart-ass baby. <laughs> if I could have been cognitive to make that decision. I, uh, I live here, and I like living in the States. I'm not one of those Canadians who moves here, and then they're like, uh, healthcare, <laughs> But seriously, healthcare, you guys. Like, it's crazy that you guys don't. You guys are like, maybe I should not be paying not to die in my bed at home. Uh, but... The, for sure the hardest thing to get used to about living in America is the way Americans are like the friendliest assholes I have ever met in my entire life. You guys are just the nicest bunch of pricks on the entire planet. And if that is confusing, here's what I'm talking about. I'm in New York. It's a Saturday. I'm at the subway. I'm waiting for the C train. D train rolls up. Everyone gets on but me, literally every single person. And then the train driver sticks his head out the window and he goes, hey, what train are you waiting for? And I'm like, I'm waiting for the, uh, the C train. He goes, it doesn't run on the weekends. Where you going? <laughs> and I tell him and he goes, Psh, get on. <laughs> I have never been so thrilled to be spoken to like a moron in my entire life. That guy went from such a dick to so helpful in the same sentence. How do you guys talk to children like this? Eh, hey, what are you doing? Painting the sky green and the ground blue. Flip the paper over. <laughs> hey, you, why your mother left us? Go get some ice cream. Uh, also, there's a thing in this country where you guys, you guys will like invoke the name of your country as a reason for why things should be better than they are? Yeah, the sky agrees. Thank you, Wikipedia man right here. Captain Fetchek is on the case. The case that did not need to be solved because it is the premise to a comedic thing. Uh, very bizarre. 
He's telling the truth, everyone. Don't worry. All right. Okay, sorry. Uh, I go so, and you guys, right, you guys will use the name of your country as a reason for why things should be better than they are. Whereas in Canada, we will invoke the name of our country as an excuse for why things are as shitty as they are. So you'll be at a restaurant in America, and a customer will be like, You don't have onion rings! Ah! Oh, this is America, damn it! <laughs> Whereas if you're in Canada, the waitress would be like, We don't have onion rings! This is Canada, damn it! <laughs> now eat your non-curly fries, you piece of shit. <laughs> Also, you guys do this thing where it's like Democrats will go on television around election season and they will go, oh, I'll tell you this, if the Republicans win, I am seriously considering moving to Canada. We can hear you in Canada. We get all the same channels you guys do, except like stars and verses, so who gives a shit? But it's like not, it's not nice to know that there are people who think of the nation of your birth as a backup plan. You guys are down here like, oh man, things are so terrible. I'm thinking about moving to that shithole. Like it's a big day, like, oh, I'll do it. I'm crazy. <laughs> I'll take my wife and kids with me, too. I'm that out of my mind. And people are like, you know, they can hear you in Canada. And they're like, I don't care. This is America, damn it. I feel like what's crazy is I immediately also felt like I fit in when I was like, oh, these guys are like friendly assholes, just like me. Maybe without the friendly part, though. Um, people, there's this weird thing. I don't know how good this is going to be because I was just thinking about it. There's this thing where everyone thinks, like, all Americans are like, oh, Canadians, so friendly, so nice. You guys are so nice. It's like, yeah, to your face. Like, Canada has mastered the art of getting tourism dollars from people they despise. <laughs> like, we are not nice once you guys leave. Every Martin Luther King day, when every, I used to work in the gift shop at the Hockey Hall of Fame, which is like the most shittily Canadian job you could possibly have. Like, I, I also made dog sleds in my spare time. Like, I sound like such a dink when I say that. But every Martin Luther King day, all these fucking guys from Rochester would come up and I would just want to destroy the city of Rochester afterwards, but the whole time just like, yeah, no, thank great. Have a have a great day, man. Oh yeah. Oh, is Bobby Orr better than Gretzky? Because Bobby Orr didn't need to wear a faggy helmet. Awesome, man. I'm glad you guys came up. That's like a specific hockey reference that might be lost. Well you guys are like a hockey. It's fine. It doesn't matter. You got it. Aha, this guy's backing me up too. We got it. He, you are fact check man, you are the groups, it doesn't matter. Look, why am I, people who seem happy and they're like, oh, I'm gonna like get involved. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna enjoy the show? Well, there's a price you gotta pay, guys. <sighs> um, I, uh, I'm a very racially sensitive person. Uh, oh, what a weird response, dude. That was one of the strangest things I've ever heard on stage. I'm a really racially sensitive. No, oh, like he was so bummed out. Yeah, yeah, this is America, damn it. And I've got, this is my punch up guy right here. I like that you're all assigning yourself roles in my life. Peterborough Peaks. Peterborough Peaks? Hockey team in Peterborough. Yeah, there are tons of hockey teams, dude. Well, what is that? You shout out one OHL team, and I'm gonna be like, my new best friend has assigned himself that role. They suck, I hated them anyway. Um, he's a Calgary Hitman guy. Named after Brett the Hitman Hart. Let's not get into minor league hockey right now. I'm trying to do comedy. <laughs> Uh, I'm really racially sensitive, like I disappointed that man with the information. Dude, I'm gonna think about that for a long time. That's gonna be something I break down all night. Uh, and I think it's because I grew up in a really white community, uh, Canada, so... Yeah, dude, yeah. yeah. Not Montreal, not Toronto, that is it, buddy. Um, Canada's so white, they like separate Jews and Italians from white people just so they can boost the numbers a little bit. Um, I thought that would get a bigger laugh. Uh, that's fine. I think that about a lot of things. That's not on you guys, that's on me. Uh, but uh, I, I, have, like, I will say there are times where it's not like as intense. Like 
Recently, I was uh, perusing the internet movie database, the message boards. You guys are familiar? Yeah. There's a database yeah. on the internet. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, sirs. <laughs> oh, man, I should not have encouraged you earlier. Um, number one rule of comedy, don't encourage. Uh, me, also, do not encourage me, mom and dad. Uh, it's like, but I was on the page, I was on the message board for the movie Mississippi Burning. For whatever reason, I don't know. It's a great movie. I like when the black guy shows up and scares the mayor. I find that that really helps with my white liberal guilt. And uh, I'm on the page, and someone had posted a link to the Ku Klux Klan's website. Yeah, guys. And I was like, oh my god. Surely, if there is one website that I have to see, it is this one. So I click the link, and let me say, first of all, you guys, the KKK, not so good with the HTML. Yeah. There is no grand webmaster of the Ku Klux Klan. Like a robe made out of a Star Wars sheet. Not a guy who exists. Do you think they'd be better, considering all their names sound like Dungeons and Dragons characters? Like, mm, I'm the Grand Wizard. I'm the Magical Dragon. What a weird culture they've appropriated. But uh, the best thing, as soon as you get there, written in huge, bold, block letters, are the words, The KKK does not endorse Barack Obama as president. No shit, Ku Klux Klan. Listen, I've always been offended by the racism, but now I'm even more offended by how little faith you have in our collective intelligence. As if they think we're so dumb, we're sitting around going, hey, what do you think America's premier racist organization thinks of the first black president? To the website! I also, yeah, I like the idea that people will be like, I gotta clear some things up on the Klan's positions on things. <laughs> like, do they also have, like, opinions on, like, labeling GMO foods? Like, hey, the Klan's not just about race. We're also about responsible agriculture. <laughs> Why does everyone focus on the race so much? <laughs> well, that's probably the reason. <laughs> um, uh, but I will say, sometimes it's not always great being so racially sensitive. Like, sometimes you're just too sure of things. Like, for a long time, I was so sure. I was like, the N-word, it's the worst word. It's just the worst word anyone could ever say to another person. I realized recently, things are not quite so black and white. Now nobody panic. The story I'm about to tell you is not gonna be like super racist. I'm not gonna be like, well I went to uh, the Klan's website and they had some things to say on the subject. <laughs> All that happened, I go and I get some fast food, I order, I sit down, wait for my food. While I'm waiting, I take out my phone, I start playing Tetris to kill time. Sitting next to me is a black gentleman. He leans over and he watches me play for like a minute, a minute and a half. And then he just looks up at me and goes, Yo, nigga, you good at Tetris. <laughs> yeah. And that was when I realized that while the N-word may be the worst thing a white guy can say to a black guy, it is the best thing a black guy can say to a white guy. Because I was so happy, you guys. Finally, I was a part of something, you know? All the sports leagues, all the groups, the Dungeons and Dragons games, nothing fulfilled me the way that moment did. The only downside was I couldn't react the way I wanted to, which was to go around high-fiving all the other white dudes in the In-N-Out Burger. I'm in the club, just a guest pass, don't get too excited. He knew, he knew what it did to me. Like, he knew how happy I was. He had a look on his face like he was like, you're welcome, white guy, all right? <laughs> Why don't you remember this moment in 10 years before you demolish a community center in a poor part of town so my buddies don't have to have a breakdance competition to save it. Also, sometimes it's just nice to be complimented by a stranger. Because I am good at Tetris. I'm fucking good at Tetris. And it is about goddamn time someone noticed. Not that you'd know, Dad. You miss all my Tetris matches because you had to work. That's like second weird reference for a joke right there. I talked about the ones that are not for everybody. That one is not for everybody. All right, I'm just gonna move on. Um, I, uh, there's like a thing I hate 
that like movies and television shows will do, like comedies, they will do this thing where they will make fun of transgendered people for being transgendered. And I hate that, like a lot. Because A, it's cruel to make fun of someone for who they are, and B, it's so lazy because they always do it the exact same way. There's always a scene where like a bunch of dudes are at a bar and one of them is making out with a hot girl and then something happens. He finds out this girl he's making out with used to be a man. Smash cut to that guy throwing up in a toilet. Like, uh, uh, oh God, oh my God, oh my God, you guys. I cannot believe that that girl I made out with used to be a man. Well then, what is the problem? <laughs> Seriously, what is the issue? Hold on. If you literally cannot believe that the girl you made out with used to be a man, what are you so upset about? Just because she used to be a man? Well, we all used to be children. <laughs> that does not make you a pedophile if you fuck someone who was not birthed in adults. <laughs> In fact, it would be way more disturbing if you had sex with someone and then they went, you know, I was never a child. <laughs> yeah. You'd be grossed out because best case scenario, you fucked a clone. <laughs> That's why they didn't have a belly button. <laughs> I feel like even if I went home with a lady and she had a penis, I'd just be like, well, what am I, perfect? <laughs> like, I'm 28 and I'm divorced. I clearly have a number of character defects way worse than just non-preferred genitalia. <laughs> and maybe I'll like it. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe for the first time in my life, I'll be like, I know what to do with one of these things. <laughs> I'll just be like, whoa, whoa, hey, lady, this is so crazy. I also have one of these things. Now, I'm not positive, but I think you might be in for a good time. I don't know, I've never, like, done this. It's like when you only practice a musical instrument by yourself and you've never played or, like, jammed with other people. But you're like, maybe I can translate my expertise in this area. And it'll be great for both of us. I, people are just scared. They're like, uh, what if I'm fucking gay? I don't want to be fucking gay. Dude, if you're gay, don't you want to be? No, as soon as possible. Like, if I'm gay, I want to know right away. Because I have really enjoyed having sex with women. And if that has been the wrong group of people to have sex with, I cannot imagine how great it actually is. It's going to be amazing, you guys. I am going to be like, oh my god. It's like the first time you watch like sports in high definition and you're like, no, I'm not going back. <laughs> Hang out at bars if I have to to watch sports. The analogy gets weird in the end. I'm not really sure what it means. Um, yeah, I don't know. Are you guys weirded out because I'm divorced? Sometimes people get uncomfortable. You're also divorced? Oh, okay. You had a very visceral reaction. You're like, hey, you think your best friend is gonna be weirded out by your divorce? It's a callback to earlier crowd work I did. <laughs> Timbits. Dude, you gotta cool it on the totally obvious Canadian references, because you're making me miss home. Uh, what? No, I'm not gonna engage with you, sir. I'm going through. I'm sticking with these people and I'm not adding any more to this fucking against my will comedy troupe I've started. Everybody welcome to the stage, Will Weldon and the Unwillings. I'm just like, Jesus, guys, I am trying to set up a joke right now. Fuck, man, God, just, Jesus. Jack Astors, do you guys have that here too? I don't know, I don't, it's fine. Um, it's a Canadian chain of horrible restaurants. People will get weirded out when I tell them I'm divorced. Even just in conversation, they'll be like, what? You're divorced? That's so crazy, you're so young and you're divorced? You're so young to be divorced. And I'm like, yeah, I think those two things might have something to do with each other. <laughs> but it's like, what? You were in a car accident, but you've always driven so recklessly. <laughs> What are the odds you would suffer the consequences of that? Other than like 95%. I actually, I do, I get hit on by uh, a lot of gay guys. And uh, I'm not gay, but it is great, man. I love it the most. No, you're too old anyway, sir. Look, 
for real. You're too old and you're wearing shorts at an ice bar. That is not happening, buddy. No fucking way, dude. Like, I wish you well, but I am not fucking you, man. Jesus. Cover your shins when you go out. Um, <laughs> I'm walking everybody individually. This guy's got a hoodie on. What is this, the Y? Uh, you got a hat on backwards. I'm not messing with the staff, but I'm shitting on all you guys. Uh, but it's not always great getting hit on by gay guys, because they're still guys, so it's like too much sometimes. Like one guy, when I was at a coffee shop, he would not leave me alone. He immediately comes over, and he's like, hey man, uh, you know, I got some coffee back at my place. I'm like, well, they also have coffee here. It's the one requirement of a coffee shop. Also, no creeps live here, as an added bonus, so I might just stick around. And then he just goes into full-on sale mode. He's like, oh, I got beer back. I got beer, too. I got beer. We can play video games. We can smoke weed. Play video games. Smoke weed. Drink some beers. Back at my place. He's, like, pitching me so hard. And I'm, like, getting really angry in my mind. Because I'm like, why won't this guy just respect me enough to be honest about what he wants? Like, look, to be fair, if all those things are true, he sounds like a great host. I will give him that. <laughs> I'm not taking anything away from him in that area. But he like, I know he just wants to have sex with me. He just wants to fuck me. He asked me nothing about myself. He wanted, he didn't, he knows nothing about me. He just wants to have sex with me and then move on to the next guy and forget about me. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm a woman right now. Holy shit. I am experiencing one moment of every woman's whole life since they were like nine years old, unfortunately. And I also realized how guys who are that annoying still managed to get laid because it got to a point where I was honestly going to go, hey, if I have sex with you, will you leave me alone? Because I honestly think I would have been less irritated by his penis in my mouth than his words in my ears. But then I realized he could still talk to me while I blow him, so that's a terrible plan. He'd just be like, how is the beer? And I'd be like, this wasn't a part of the deal. Also, great, I like Polliner. Thank you very much for having Polliner Extra Dry here for me. Another specific reference for you guys. Uh, I am, so there's a billboard uh, you see all the time on like the freeway. And on one side of it, I hate this billboard. On one side of it, It'll say something like, what if that fetus you aborted would have gone on to cure cancer? And then on the other side, there's a picture of like a sad baby who's like, why would you abort me with all my knowledge of science? <laughs> I hate that billboard for two reasons. One, that's not how science works, you guys. Curing cancer is going to be the effort of a bunch of scientists. It's not just going to be some guy in his basement who's like, it turns out it was cinnamon all along, you guys. <laughs> you are welcome. You should have asked me first. I always try cinnamon. <laughs> Second, that logic goes both ways. Yeah, sure, maybe that fetus would have gone on to be a part of the team that cured cancer. But maybe that fetus would have gone on to murder your entire family. <laughs> Or maybe that fetus would have gone on to become an abortion doctor. Oh shit, you guys. Oh my god. What if all abortions have been a future abortion doctors? What a paradox! You pointed at me very aggressively, ma'am. Boom, right out. I was like, oh no, it's the head of the Susan B. Anthony Foundation. No, ma'am. Put away your crude IED. Um, ma'am? Hey, excuse me, sweet tits. Put away your IED. The fuck is up with women? Oh, uh, ma'am? How dare you use the safest gendered term for me? I wasn't like, hey, calm down, you old bat. Um, that's, I like sir. I look like I'm 19 years old. I dig sir. All right, I'm trying to close the show. <laughs> Can't. I know, Jesus, his whole... Thank you, ladies. Good Lord, man. Jesus Christ. 
I will give the anti-abortion movement this. They are anti-abortion. Like, uh, they are committed. Nobody thinks, like, they're just in it for the sign making. They are committed. Because they will go out on the weekends with flyers with, like, bloody fetuses on them. And they will go up to people and they'll be like, look at it! Look at it! Get a good look! Because that is what abortion looks like. That is what it looks like when you murder a child and deny it the right to a life. Here's the thing with this argument. <laughs> I'm someone who's currently in the midst of living a life, and I feel like it is worth pointing out, it's kind of overrated. <laughs> it's not that great being alive, you guys. Like, I don't mind being alive, but if I were dead, I would not miss it. Not for a second. <laughs> I just wish both sides... Stop it. I'm... See, when you talk to your friend... <laughs> God damn you guys. <laughs> man. Take an etiquette class. Oh my god. I'm gonna warn the band about you dudes. I wish, I wish both sides would take this approach. I wish the pro-choice side would go out with flyers with pictures of like Venice or London or Munich on them and go up to people and be like, look at it. Look at it. Get a good look. Because that is the closest you are ever going to get. Because raising a child is incredibly expensive and you'll never afford it. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Thanks, guys. That was Will Weldon and the Unwillings.